Hi team, welcome to another ATP Geopolitics video with myself, Jonathan Emmett Pierce. This is Ukraine War news update, first part there are for the 16th of March 2024. Uh, just a bit of, I guess, housekeeping, not really. Uh, I am due to give a talk about Ukraine alongside a retired general, I think, is going to be talking or introducing me or whatnot. Anyway, that's in North Hampshire. So if you're around, I'll give you more details. It's in June time. Uh, if you're around in North Hampshire area in the UK, uh, pop along to that. It'll be great to see you. Um, anyway, in the meantime, uh, let's get to where we normally start. Ukrainian general staff figures for the Russian losses for the day before. All the usual caveats apply. You can find them in the description to the video below. Uh, one thousand, well, First thing to note is that the numbers were fairly low in the number of categories yesterday. Today, they've shot right back up. So I don't know whether there was some extenuating circumstance that, that led to the numbers being low yesterday. But anyway, 1,160 personnel lost is well up there into the thousands. Um, and, you know, a year ago, that would have been a record number. Uh, 21 tanks is very high indeed. Uh, 20, I mean, losing 21 tanks in a day, goodness me. 24 armoured personnel vehicles and 26 artillery systems. So high across all of those categories, particularly tanks. Uh, two anti-aircraft warfare systems. Don't know what type they are. That would be useful. Andrew Perpetua hasn't got his list out yet for today. I know the guy's working obscenely hard at the moment. In fact, I might show you a little... A snippet of his recent video to give you an idea of of how much data that guy collects uh, or his team 31 vehicles and fuel tanks and one piece of special equipment so yeah pretty significant numbers across a number of those categories so I hope you checked out my live stream yet yesterday with Danielle from Turchney who is you know part of the extended team or or Andrew's part of the Turchney team and Andrew's Andrew and his guys do data collection from which Turchney take their data and then analyze it, etc., etc. Or Andrew was saying this on his recent live stream, and just that I guess March is a month of inordinate numbers of things happening, and Andrew's collecting as much of that data as he possibly can. And um, this new spreadsheet has. Um, just for right March, now, just for March, fifteen thousand entries. So I, I made a new spreadsheet because we got the twenty thousand, and it's at fifteen thousand already. And I feel like I'm losing my mind. <laughs> That's how I feel. So these stats that are right here, these are for March, and this isn't like super formatted or whatever. It's just I just. I don't know, the formatting is pretty trash, but I just, I just, I was just curious. I was just doing this a moment ago. I, like I did this like literally like, like three minutes ago. I was just curious. So this is how many vehicles that we had, or, or not, not vehicles, but this is how many items we had in March. Just, just one month, not even a month, 15 days, not even 15 days. It's like 14 and a half, 14 and a half days. <laughs> okay. So, um, you've seen I, I post the vehicle stuff like every day so you've, you've seen the vehicles for <laughs> i mean there have been days of like a hundred like multiple days of a hundred vehicles um a lot of them damaged you know so the number of destroyed kind of surprised me but but the the, the drone dropped bombs i honestly thought this would be a bigger number because i feel like i spent so much of my day doing them and they're miserable i hate them um, but yeah, this is drone drop bomb plus the 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 Baba Yaga. So I counted them in the, the same category. We don't always separate them in, in the data. I separate them now for sure, but we didn't always do it regularly. So anyway, so that's drone drop bombs. The FPV drones, 2,075 FPV drones. These aren't broken down by who used them or whatever, but... Uh, but 2,075 FPV drones just this month, dude. It's so much. And then, uh, you know, I have a, another database that's just for shelling. And that database is, like, much larger, like, way bigger. Um, it's getting close to, like, 300,000 at this point. But but just in just in this database where we don't... we This is just our geolocation database. So this is only geolocated stuff. 
Um, so that's 949 shellings. Jesus. And then, um, oh, I forgot. No, no, no. Yeah, it should. It should include uh, MRL, because I, I searched by shelling, and we call it the MRL shelling is MRL shelling. And so any any line that include the word shelling should include it. This should also include um, uh, aerial MRL shelling. So like when they shoot the unguided rockets, it should include that too. And then there's uh, airstrikes, uh, 289 airstrikes. And and there's 5,641 total. Um, this... So there is an overlap there. So some of the things here will be included in stuff there. Uh, but you get the point is that, that March is being a very very big month for stats but also the sheer volume of work these guys do is absolutely insane they are doing such a service to OSINT and actually to nations we know that Kamishin uh, the uh, top knot guy who's in charge of the strategic industries and whatnot is using Andrew's data to get an, to get a handle on what's going on with FPV drones uh, and he's taken Andrew's data and done his own presentation with it and put that out on Twitter. So, th so Andrew and his and his guides are just honestly doing phenomenal work here, uh, and it, it then feeds into this understanding of whether the general star figures are at least somewhat accurate or not, uh, and it just gives us a really good handle about on on what's going on. And, and we we are looking at. Uh, you know, when we do live streams like I did yesterday with members of Turchini like Daniela, we we get a really good understanding of how the war is is playing out, how what is going on in terms of how who has the advantage in the numbers of drones being used and how they're being used, so on and so forth. And it all comes down, it all comes out of the this the data collection that that Andrew and his his guys are doing just absolutely amazing right going on to that i haven't got much in this section other than i just wanted to play you that andrew stuff uh dozens of good russians here so here's a picture of just a whole bunch of human bodies i can't show it to you but there are just very large numbers of of people being taken out uh and actually i've seen various ones of, of large numbers of russian soldiers dead I've also seen uh, the one I uh, I showed yesterday or referenced yesterday of the one of the units north of the border, one of the free Russia units also took uh, quite a lot of casualties in one particular strike. There are differing claims as to what's going on uh, north of the border and whether it's a good idea or not. We'll come to speak about that a little bit later. Richard Recker from War Spotting saying Russia has lost at least 13,271 uh, bits of military equipment so far, including 165 in March, 13,056 before that, all recorded on warspotting.net. Over the past few months, uh, the proportion of IFVs and APCs has increased sharply. So you can see this orange uh, segment here. They are losing more of that than they, they were previously in the war. Um, tanks going down a little bit, but it was quite high. So I guess what what fewer is this dark green, isn't it? Transport, so things like military trucks, and I just think that will be a lot to do with they don't have much, much many military trucks left, and so they're using a lot more things like SUVs and bukankas. And I don't know whether <laughs> war spotting tracks those. I know Andrew does in his list, so he, he set, separates civilian stuff from from the military stuff, but I don't know whether these guys at wall spotting camp stuff like suvs um and atvs being being hit so that could be why you're seeing i think it's quite significant you look back here a really significant proportion that's a good 25 percent a good quarter of what was lost at that point were were uh trucks and and whatnot transport and then you come down here and that's moved to what less than 10 percent uh, and now we are seeing a larger percentage of IFVs. Now, remember, the, this is percentage and not real numbers. So it doesn't mean more IFVs are being blown up necessarily. It means of the amount of stuff that's getting blown up, the proportion is more IFVs. It could be that fewer vehicles in total are being destroyed here. And so therefore, IFVs take up a, a greater percentage. So anyway, um, 
last few months, more IFVs and APCs proportion has increased sharply with artillery, transport and other types relatively declining. However, this may be an availability of data bias as the FPV drones that so effectively hit IFVs and APCs have become more common. So again, it could be, well, there could be many reasons, right, why that is the case. Uh, if we look at uh, totals, let's look at totals then. Uh, if we look at uh, totals in March so far, well, let's go back to February, 413. So there's a few, December and January definitely dropped uh, from 500 in October. No, then down, yeah, but uh, I guess, no, I mean, there are spike months that really spike. November 2022, of course, you had the counter offensives and whatnot. September 1163, goodness me. Uh, but then, yeah, uh, May 667, that's when I think the Ukrainians went on, started there. No, that's not because that's 2023. So, yeah, just there are. So, here, yeah, not not crazy amounts in the counter offensive time here, but in the Kherson and. Um, uh, Kharkiv counter-offensives, yeah, there were spikes. So anyway, uh, just some more data analysis there for you, all the links in the uh, description below. We move on to distant strikes now. And as Tim White says here, after the pain and destruction in Ukraine yesterday, that's referring to Odessa, air defenders almost had a night off. Only two drones sent in to Ukraine and both were shot down. Um, Russia has not done a large-scale missile strike on Ukraine for 38 days. They send the occasional missiles here and there, but that's pretty incredible. As I always say, you would if you could, you aren't, so problem means you can't. There's n if, if Russia had enough missiles to be throwing missiles into Ukraine right now, they would be throwing missiles into Ukraine right now. Because they occasionally throw stuff in, which means they've got targets. They know where stuff is, so why aren't they? You've got two options, but... Both options mean they don't have enough missiles. I don't think there's any way... If they have enough missiles, they would be using them. So they don't have enough missiles because they either don't have enough full stop or... So that's one option. They just they just don't have the missiles. They aren't, there's something wrong with production and procurement of missiles. Or, number two, they're stockpiling to do a big attack on Ukraine at some point for some reason, right? And I think that's probably quite likely... But if you are stockpiling and not being able to use missiles now, it means you don't have enough to both stockpile and use, right? So you still have this situation where they, they're not producing enough missiles for what they would like. <clears throat> I think they're probably stockpiling. To, uh, and I think there's probably going to be at least some being stockpiled for the F-16s when they arrive to hit air, to completely overwhelm air bases that they know F-16s are at. I'm fairly sure that's going to be high on the agenda. And whether they're stockpiling for, for some other strategic targets, I don't know. But anyway, the last large-scale strike was on February the 7th when Russia launched 31X-101 or KH-101 uh, calibre cruise missiles and 7 Iskander and KH-22 missiles into Ukraine. Um, so yesterday, a lot of people very unhappy with the double tap strike on Odessa with this kind of missiles. So these are very hard to shoot down and they cause quite a bit of destruction. In fact, it, it appears now 20 died in that. So 20 people died in, in the strikes on Odessa yesterday. One missile arrived and then when the rescue workers arrived to clear rubble and provide aid, another missile struck at exactly the same location. Russia Telegram channels are gleefully celebrating the killing of rescue workers. I think seven rescue workers died in that, in that double tap strike, and that's why people are so angry. Indeed, in New York here, there was a rally in New York City following a Russian missile strike on civilians in Odessa. At least 20 people were killed, 46 wounded, seven of them being first responders who were hit with the second missile as they rushed to help the injured Ukrainians there. Just, yeah, not cool. Um... Astra reports, so this is Russian media outlet reports, a, a drone detonated on the oil refinery in Belgorod. Despite the detonation at 2am, they said there was no damage nor casualties. I don't know anything about this uh, other than that. I do know that other refineries were hit last night in Russia. So this morning, 6am local time, Russian oil refinery in Suzan, Suz, Suzran, Samara region was attacked by drones. On the video, the man mentions that the AVT-6 is done. And that K2 column is on fire. The capacity of the ABT-6 
on the Sizran oil refinery is 6 million tonnes per year. It's about 70% of the capacity of the entire oil refinery that has 8.5 million tonnes per year. So you take that out, you that's, that's the end of most of the oil refining at that facility. Uh, location of uh, of it is is there um, just in case you want to know where that is, uh, which is you know fair distance away from Ukraine. These are being hit, and additional footage of the fire at the, on the territory of the oil refinery. I mean, there's some pretty significant footage coming out of that. Uh, it is yeah that that's that's on fire, shall we say? Um, uh, and there you go. Uh, so. They also hit uh, another oil refinery, uh, the Novokubishevsk refinery as well. So two refineries being hit last night is significant. Uh, Ukrainian drones attacked two refineries in the Samara region. According to the governor of the region, drones attacked them both. Um, as a result, fire broke out on, at the oil processing plant. Uh, and then Kremlin media reports that Ukrainian drones attacked the Russian city of Kursk as well. I don't know about any details there and it looks like something flaming in the sky there so maybe air defense had succeeded in in taking something out and it fell to the ground and then belgorod there's stuff going on and i don't really understand what's going on in belgorod so that's a city that's just over the border from ukraine in the belgorod oblast that is being having lots of pressure put on it by <coughs> the free russian fighters so the governor of Belgorod claims uh, two people have been injured in a morning attack from the rebel forces. Despite this, Russia claims that some sort of success saying eight rockets of the vampire multiple launch rocket system were shot down on approach to the city. In other words, because I can't understand that, that those free Russian people will be flinging stuff into the city. Like, it just makes no sense. Like they're not, I assume they're not trying to do like terrorism on the Russians that the, they have only limited supplies. They're going to be trying to hit military targets. So I think it probably is like, and I'm not trying to be positive for them here, just like what makes most sense. And if the Russians are saying they've shot down eight of these missiles and these missiles are falling in the city, then it appears that this is air defense that is doing this. So Russian Defense Ministry reported the downing of eight Ukrainian RM-70 shells over, Belgr over Belgorod on the morning of the 16th of March, and then footage like that comes out. So while Ukraine has mostly learned to keep air defense outside cities, Russians have not, says Jay in Kiev. Again, I, I, I can't talk to the accuracy of this, but he's claiming that it's the air defenses operating inside Belgorod. And we know that they put air defenses on top of like roofs and, st roofs and stuff. We've seen that in Moscow. Uh, incompetent Russian air defenses are littering Belgorod with casualties, blowing up cars and buildings. That's what he said. So he's confident that, that the attacks, that the explosions inside Belgorod are coming from the, uh, as a result of Russian air defenses working. Now, just talking about uh, general analysis of these strikes on the oil refineries, Russians themselves have started talking about the issues of the attacked oil refineries more seriously. It's clear that these weak targets are so easy to reach by democratic drones. I can't know what he means by that. Russia may face the same fuel issues that the Wehrmacht had in World War II, says uh, Dmitry from War Translated. After talking with people, says this Russian source, from the refinery, it became clear that with this approach of ours, they will continue to attack the oil industry in the European part of the country. Absolutely ineffective protection measures were taken. And according to the law, business will not be able to do anything other than these measures. For two years, no one woke up or moved. Maybe now they will understand what's what and where all this can lead. So a little bit of consternation there from uh, from your man talking here. And it's the idea that there there isn't really any air defences. These are private enterprises. Uh, and we'll come back to that idea, actually. I, I think um, there's some more analysis along those lines. Let's just read what John Ridge says. So the campaign against the Russian hydrocarbon industry seems to be off to an earnest start. Aside from creating direct economic effects, this campaign is likely designed to force a redeployment of Russian GBAD, so ground-based air defense systems, assets to the interior of Russia away from the front. So this is exactly what you know we've all been talking about for, for weeks, but this is definitely the problem. You know, let's go back to the analogy of there's a blanket inside Russia that is not big enough for the Russian bed. Right. So you've got a blanket. It's not big enough for the bed. And as soon as you pull it into one direction, you are leaving your feet bare over there or you're leaving an area of the bed 
bare over there. So then you go over there, you you pull the blanket back that way, and it leaves somewhere else bare. There's not enough air defences to to defend all of these places, evidently because these places are getting blown up and nothing's stopping them. I mean, I you know, I think you would if you could. You, you answer, you can't. I think if the Ukrainians had a hundred more drones to send off in a given night, they would send off a hundred more drones. I think they're just throwing out what they can at the moment as they're scaling up production. But you would expect somewhere like that, if it doesn't really have air defense, like five drones, 10 drones to be hitting that place and that put it out of out of business, you know, for more fundamentally. I mean, it, just one drone is enough to actually do that though. So there is that argument. Now, it's clear that there aren't air defences there. So what do the Russians do? Do the Russians go, right, my goodness, they are just going to hammer every single uh, oil uh, and gas facility in, in Russia. How many of these do we have? Oh, my goodness, we've got loads of them. Where are they? They're pretty much everywhere, okay? Uh, well, actually, a lot of them are, are closer to Ukraine because of the infrastructure needed for the, for, the, for that. You, you bring them closer because that's where most of the people are because that's where the end products are going to go to the people, right? So there are there are some that are far away in, in the middle of nowhere and that's good for safety reasons but not so good for infrastructural reasons. So, okay, we've got loads of places. Uh, how, much, how many pits of air defence do we have? Well, we've got no spare air defence because we had to bring stuff down from St. Petersburg at the beginning of the war to the front line. We've had to move stuff around. Then when Moscow started getting hit, we had to move stuff to Moscow and then St. Petersburg. And then So we don't have enough. So what happens to all these oil refineries? Well, we, we either take stuff off the front line or from Moscow or St. Petersburg and put them around there. But then we've got to choose because we probably don't have enough to, to support all of these places. So then we've, we've got to choose the ones that are still operational. But then what happens down near the front lines? Well, OK, we've got no air defence against Ukrainian aviation near the front lines. OK, so this is a, this is a problem for the Russians. It absolutely is a problem. And uh, it, it's a really important headache that that needs some kind of pill, but I don't think there are any pills available for them. So this is really good news, I think, for the Ukrainians. Now, the, one of the drones that the, the Ukrainians are using is this new Lyuti or Fierce drone, which is kind of an upgrade from the Beaver drone that was being used. It's what the Russians call a uh, is is what the Russians call it uh, the drone that's been burning up their oil refineries and storage depots. Uh, Ukraine has been striking deep into Russia, seemingly at will, says Daniel R here. What is the drone that is doing so much damage? So he then goes and looks at this drone. The only thing we definitely know about it is a small model next to a flower and a cat. <laughs> the, that's basically everything else comes from footage that people have taken of the drone uh, in in action. You know, Russian mobile phones taking taking that imagery. Whereas the Beaver drone and stuff like that, we've seen like promo pictures and whatnot this is much more of a secretive drone uh, it's got this sort of uh, twin boom v tail um it, the, apparently this model is fairly accurate three blade push pusher propeller so it pushes it from behind um cooling intakes and the sides suggest a boxer engine okay so on and so forth etc 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 i mean you can go and, uh, and look at a thread like this um so what can we what can we find uh, what can we really learn from it um, so uh, that's the engine, that's a nose. I, the, so the Luti, Luti has some similarities to the Beaver. So this is a Beaver that I've, I've shown you before, um, that we do, we've seen quite a few images of, um, but it's much larger. So that, that one, that twin boom tail is one, the Luti is much larger, has a complex engine cow while the beaver has no cow. There is attention to small details like fairings where the tail booms attach. Uh, a video of it in flight suggests it's very stable. It's also been extremely successful at attacking targets deep into Russia. The drone in the uh, this video hit an oil refinery. Um, the airframe looks great. Uh, Ukraine has used these with skill. Attacks on refineries look perfect and smooth turns before a terminal dive. So that that one there, it circles around and then it and then it dives down. I mean, it just and it works really well. These attacks were extremely precise. A Lyoti is big enough to carry a useful payload, a thousand kilometers, but small enough to be made in large quantities. With these, Ukraine can seriously dent Russia's exports as well as hurt them militarily. 
uh, yeah, and and if if Russia is not shooting these things down around these oil refineries, it means they don't have the the amount of air defences that they need in order to defend their their energy infrastructure. And Ukraine will be taking advantage of that. You're going to see this as we are, we've seen this every night now for for how many days? And it will happen tomorrow tonight, and it will happen tomorrow night, and it will happen the next night until Russia do something about it. But if they can't do something about it. It's open season. Honestly, this is this is really significant. And imagine if Ukraine had five times the amount of drones. Like you would see, instead of this happening on consecutive nights, as they're producing these drones, they're sending them off. It's what I think. You would have right instead of hitting one drone one night, two, two sorry, one refinery one night, two refineries the next night, one three. It'll be like let's hit ten refineries in one night. Let's do it. Send them all out. But you're not seeing that because I presume they can't at the moment, the Ukrainians. Right, going on to other bits and pieces, we're going to spend a little time on the Russian voting going on at the moment for the presidential election. Now, just to let you know, I did that Gerasimov is alive. So Valery Gerasimov is alive, as uh, as we saw from that voting. And I said, look, it doesn't change my probability assessment from when I made it back then because I didn't have this data. So my assessment was absolutely correct. Now my data has, uh, data's come in, new data has come in, my assess assessment has changed in that <clears throat> he's obviously not dead. So was he injured or ill? And goodness me, the number of you on that thread that said he there's something wrong with him. Like if you look at the way he walks and the way he is and the way he looks vacant and he's following uh, Shoigu to do everything... A lot of people saying brain damage, a lot of people saying walking issues, a lot of people saying, um, you know, all sorts of proposed theories going on. But I think what we can probably tell, again, it's a probability assessment, as all things are, is that he he probably isn't operating at 100% and he probably isn't able to, uh, to command the armed forces as the commander in chief, which is why we haven't seen him. We haven't seen him for three months. Because I think he was either injured in that strike or some kind of heart attack or, or some kind of illness. Who knows? But he's not in a good place now. And that video, although it shows him alive, like if they wanted... So the thing is, you would if you could, you aren't, so you can't. Like, they would have shown him properly alive a long time previously if they were able to. But they, they didn't because I would suggest he was in hospital or something, something meant that there was just they were unable to do that. They've done it now, but he's still not looking. He's still not looking great. Anyway, going back to the actual voting here, Ukrainian intelligence has been trying to hack the Russian online voting systems. Ukraine's military intelligence, the HUR or GUR uh, agency, said it is attack is hacking online voting systems in Russia. As the first day of the country's presidential elections got underway yesterday, now there have been multiple videos of this happening. Uh, that I've seen an old woman do this. I've seen a young woman do this. Multiple cases of people pouring what looks to be ink in ballot boxes are reported during the Russian presidential elections. Uh, and so, yeah, th that's what it looks like. And of course, none of those ballots are going to be usable. So people just tried to destroy the elections from, you know, Russians who are just obviously not not happy. Now, then there's video. So we, I showed you a video of someone putting a lighter next to the ticks and the ink on the pens that they use at the ballots uh, is disappearing ink. So they can disappear the ink and then tick whatever box they want afterwards. Now, there's this video of ballot workers now, this person says they're throwing away correct ballots, but I don't think that's what's happening here. If you look closely, I think this is what this person says is more likely PS01 saying the Banana Republic International Observers went home, but voting continues at the polling station outside of opening hours. Truly democratic, Banana Republic. Um, so I think what they're doing here is is putting in more ballots into the voting uh, ballot boxes. It, they are These are voting forms. I don't think they're taking ones out and throwing them away. I think they're probably putting, like, correct ones in, ones that are voting for Putin, and they're just putting them in. Uh, but, of course, you know, quite often when you are in a, a, a room dark at night, in, when, when it's dark outside and you've got lights on, you think no one can see you, right? Because you think, oh, it's dark. and But, of course, people can see you very clearly in. Um, and, yeah. That is uh, obviously not cool. Now, uh, there's an exit poll of voters in Prague, and I presume these are Russian voters who are diaspora Russia, Russian community in Prague, voting at their embassy or whatever. And apparently, according to the exit poll, only 4% of people there voted for 
Putin. And that's um, that's understandable. They're not in Russia and they're probably because they want to escape what's going on there and don't want to be mobilised for a war they disagree with. Um, yesterday, the organi they organised a noon against Putin event as it was only available the only available day for voting. Right. Then, to, just to go quickly, and again, I don't really know what's going on here, but footage released by the Russian Volunteer Corps firing towards Gryveron checkpoint on the border with Russia. This is a BTR 82A that is being used, and it was one that was captured when they previously attacked Gryveron in May 2023. Russian Volunteer Corps made a statement about the corps' elimination. So the Russians claimed that they eliminated the entire corps. All statements by the Defence Ministry about the destruction of our corps in its entirety is just another lie. The limited military operation in Belgorod and Kursk regions continues and here is a confirmation. A new batch of prisoners from among the Russian forces armed force, Russian armed forces. And once again we invite Governor Gladkov to a meeting to hand over the prisoners for exchange. Um, so presumed to, that they've had some of their own troops uh, captured as well. Now some people are questioning whether this is sensible. Andrew Perpetua was going nuts about this, saying it's insane. It's as insane as the attack towards Tokmak in the Robotina area, which he's not a fan of. So he thinks this is wasting good equipment, that there are there are some fairly decent bits of kit that these guys have lost, tanks and, and some even more valuable recovery vehicles have been lost. And then other people saying, actually, you don't know the full details about what's going on. I don't know the details here, so I won't cast my opinion. I keep saying, like, I don't know what's going on here. But what I will say is that the success of this might be unmeasurable. So I think it's all about the timing. This is all about the elections, and that's why I put it here. So the election stuff, the presidential elections are massively important. So the, the Ukrainians are hammering away at the oil refineries now. For that reason. And these guys are attacking into Russian oblasts for that reason. And you can't measure the success in terms of how it affects Russian opinions and morale in the general public. It's just unmeasurable. So it's it, you might look at it and say, well, they haven't taken much land and they've lost this, this equipment and those people. But actually, they are achieving other things that, that I think is, is probably quite important. Now, the RSW has come out and said already this summer, Russia will launch a new major offensive against Ukraine. Uh, the Institute for the Study of War says the Russians take advantage of resources on the battlefield and successfully identify the weak points of the Ukrainian defence. And this makes it possible to change the style of attack. So I don't know whether it means that all the offensives that are going on now that seem to be grinding to a little bit of a halt or at least slowing down are just the kind of, what is it, uh, reconnaissance attacks to work out what the weak points are before a major attack in summer that they're building for i don't know maybe uh, i don't know if this is kind of a warning shot to get people to give more assistance to ukraine but i think everyone's working hard to do that anyway i i don't know if russia will be able to do that and if they do it will be with pretty low quality troops and equipment i i don't know let me know what you think uh, in the meantime the y ukrainians are opening or aiming to open two industrial parks in Rivna in Lviv regions, uh, according to the Prime Minister, a park in the Rivna region specialising in industrial processing, where the creation of 1,400 jobs is expected. Um, that's $25.78 million worth of investment. And a park in Lviv region is a processing industry with a special emphasis on furniture production, creation of more than 2,000 new jobs. It's like, we're at war. Yeah, let's. Let, we're just going to invest in this furniture factory. Hmm, that, that furniture there. That's quite a big sofa. It looks. It's like a Bogdana one hundred and fifty-five mil self-propelled gun-shaped sofa. That's interesting. Ooh, how much is that sofa? Oh, right, couple of million dollars. That's an expensive sofa. That, and it's not very comfortable. I mean, it's made of metal. Yeah, you get the point. The creation of more than 2,000 jobs and investments worth $51.56 million. <laughs> Just investing $51 million in furniture production in the middle of a war. Because, God damn it, we've got a lot of armchair generals here. <laughs> we just need to provide for them. Everyone's got an opinion and they need to sit down comfortably for that opinion. I'll have one of them, thanks. So, evidently, uh, this is going to be part of the Defence Military Industrial Complex, surely. Uh, uh, and... 
we've already had Rheinmetall saying they're going to invest in four factories in Ukraine and I'm pre pretty sure this will be going towards that. Anyway, uh, thanks for watching. Please like, subscribe and share. Uh, I really appreciate your support. Today is the last day of the Six Nations Rugby Tournament and all three matches are being played on the same day and so my output today might be constrained by my desire to sit in front of the TV with a beer and shout a lot. Uh, that I shout m m most shouting I do is is watching rugby matches. So uh, that's where I get my most at my most nationalistic. Nothing else particularly bothers me, but that does. So uh, yeah, output today might be a bit different. Toodle pips. <laughs>